Today we are at the Hilton Sydney for AI Med Australia 2019 to see how Australian clinicians are being brought in to better understand the current state of AI in healthcare. When machine intelligence is combined with human cognition, in healthcare the term medical intelligence is all encompassing. It's not about the doctor being replaced by AI, but the doctor using AI for decision support, image analysis, medicine and predictive modelling. The inaugural AI Med Australia conference brought together clinicians, hospital leaders and technology experts to understand the role of biomedical data science. AI Med was founded in the US by clinicians who are passionate about data and intelligence and driven to transform thinking from evidence-based medicine to intelligence-based medicine. This mission reflects the transformative impact that AI-inspired technology is having on healthcare as it enters a phase of what Dr. Anthony Cheng calls smart artificial intelligence. I'm the Chief Intelligence and Innovation Officer at my hospital of Children's Hospital Orange County, which means I'm in charge of both um, innovation as well as artificial intelligence projects, both in our hospital and try to foster that interest um, in the U.S. and around the world. And, and I'm an academic, so I'm at Macquarie Uni. I run something called the Centre for Health Informatics, which is about uh, 45 people focusing on AI and decision support, and also run a, a large Australian alliance called the Australian AI Alliance in Healthcare, which is about 90 organisations strong. So what exactly is smart artificial intelligence and how will that impact the healthcare industry in the next five years? Well, I classify smart artificial intelligence as um, artificial general intelligence or artificial intelligence that's going to be able to mimic how the human brain thinks across a spectrum of activities and not just a narrow task which is um, what we are able to do right now. Yes, yeah, so for example um, AI today can do things like interpret x-rays, radiology images, it's very good at looking at images. Um, we've used some kind of AI uh, or decision support for the last 20 years on helping doctors prescribe medications or look for errors. So it's been around in one form or another for a long time, but there's a lot of interest in the last couple of years because of new technologies like deep neural networks. And Dr. Anthony Cheng, um, why did you study biomedical data science and AI and how have these skills developed? Well, I've always uh, been proud to be a nerd um, in, in school, including high school. I was, I think, the only person that was in the math, chess, and computer clubs. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I've always been interested in data and databases and taught biostatistics for a long time and I think when uh, the IBM supercomputer Watson beat the human contestants on February 14th, 2011, I realized the world of data science has changed. And downloading the application, applied and was fortunate to get into the Stanford program. And how can AI be used to benefit patients given the challenges in adoption? So the first message for you today in terms of the good is that, at least in my opinion, we already have the technology we need to make major changes in the system. And we've had those technologies actually for a long time. I think for patients, people already are using AI in some countries. So for example, you can get an app which will help you check your symptoms and say whether you need to go and see a doctor, go to the emergency room or not, um, help you. So Google, for example, when it does the search, is using AI underneath that to help you find the answers to the questions you might have. So I think we're already, without realising it, as patients or consumers, getting support from AI. What are some of the misconceptions in AI? You spoke about how greater accuracy does not necessarily mean better outcomes. Could you explain? Well, I think a lot of focus um, in data science right now is to create more and more accurate models in terms of um, being able to uh, accurately uh, diagnose based on an image or decision support, but I think that doesn't always translate to a better outcome from the patient's perspective. So I think that hopefully the refocus is going to be on patient outcomes in addition to accuracy of the model. Yeah, so just solving a problem because you can doesn't mean it'll make a difference. So if the doctor is already good at making that decision, uh, and you do it just as well as the doctor with an AI, you haven't really solved a problem. But if you can improve on what we're doing now, that will make a difference. And I think the ultimate challenge is going to be changing human behavior. So even when you know you can change the outcome, how do you possibly perhaps deploy AI to change human behavior, I think will be the third challenge. And speaking of human behavior, what are some of the communication and learning techniques that clinicians need to adopt in order to have 
better conversations with their patients? Well, I think we um, need to be the intermediary between machine intelligence and what patients are going through. So I think that is a new brand of medicine in terms of interpreting what the machines are saying. At the same time, still maintain the empathy and compassion that we all strive for uh, when we deliver patient care. Yeah, so you know, we've already got very clunky technology now. So if you go and see your doctor, they'll probably spend half of the consultation staring at the computer screen and the record. It would be great if the AI would improve that. So imagine if you could have something like an Alexa or a Siri sitting on the desktop with your GP and you just have a chat to your doctor and magically all that screen work is done by the AI. That's where we'll end up in five or ten years' time. So my hope is that using technology is not just to help um, be better at diagnosis or treatment selection, but actually making that process of care simple might actually improve the way we engage with doctors. I say the um, artificial intelligence makes the visible invisible. So hopefully it will take away the computer from the sanctuary of the patient room and makes the invisible visible by looking at signals from, from the noise. What happens when data sets from disease states or conditions are small? Technical question. So it, it depends, I guess, on what you're trying to do with it. Um, you need lots and lots of data for, say, deep learning uh, for images, but um, there are some problems where you don't need that. So it really depends on the problem you're trying to solve, which is what we were saying before. Um, not every problem is going to need a massive data set, but um, in general, any data science would say the more the better and the higher quality the better. Yes, I think deep learning is getting a lot of publicity, but I think what's exciting about this publicity is hopefully we'll leverage this, pu this publicity to raise the awareness and education level of all healthcare practitioners. So based on your conversations with Australian clinicians, is Australia heading at the same pace and direction of AI globally? I think we have, um, in terms of adoption of digital health, in you know, our records, etc., we are doing really, really well globally, um, we're certainly on pace there. Um, I think we have across primary care, we've got a very big primary care sector in Australia, 30% of the workforce, um, and they already use technologies like prescribing systems. But when it comes to the cutting edge use of AI, I would say I'm not seeing very much of it, um, and we probably are behind quite a bit compared to, say, the United Kingdom or the US. Is that your impression since you've been here? Uh, no, I, th I think um, I'm actually quite encouraged by what I've seen mm. here. I think, um, I think Australia has the challenge of the landmass and trying to connect the cities that are deploying artificial intelligence and healthcare. I think no country to me of the countries I visited, and we should probably include China as well, um, is clearly ahead. Um, various countries are perhaps ahead in certain areas, but no one is clearly ahead across the board. But I've been actually quite encouraged from what I've seen the last day or two uh, in Australia in terms of the level of interest, the engagement, as well as the um, uh, projects that have already been deployed. And I think it won't take much for Australia to go to the next level and just sort of making the human-to-human -human relationships that's necessary for collaboration. Mm -hmm. If I've got to say, if we have one natural advantage is we've got a high function health system that's joined up and uh, say compared to other countries where it's very fragmented, we tend to have you know, large state health systems that work together with single platforms. So I think maybe we won't be doing all of that technical innovation that might be happening in Silicon Valley, but we can lead in the adoption and use of AI. So that's, that's what I'm hoping will happen. Um, someone, I think a few months ago, quoted that 47% of the present jobs will be either seriously um, heavily reconfigured or replaced by automation. 47%. Not 45, not 50, but 47% based on their um, research. So uh, I think, as we talked about in the past um, day, I don't see clinicians being replaced anytime soon because there's so many other things that we do that uh, automation will not be able to take over. You spoke about how AI will only replace 47% of jobs. So why will um, AI not replace clinicians? Well, for several reasons. One is, I think, the AI gurus that have publicly announced that, um, that AI will replace radiologists probably do not really understand the nature of a radiologist's job. Um, radiologist does a lot more than simply interpreting medical images. 
I also think that um, I actually predicted that there'll be more radiologists in the future, not less, because I think the job will be reconfigured to an even more interesting career for medical students that are interested in radiology. As a matter of fact, I think last year we actually saw more applicants for radiology residency programs because I think partly because of the interesting technology that's being imbued in the, in the subspecialty. Yeah, so I think work's going to change. One of the things about healthcare is that there are more problems to solve than we have the resources to solve. So as we get better at being efficient through technologies like AI, we'll just be able to address more, tech, more clinical problems. But we're still going to need people to help do that, at least for the next mm -hmm. few decades. Well beyond our retirement. That's what I was, about. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> so why did you feel that Australia needed its own AI med chapter? So I think Australia um, needs to come together. We're, as Anthony said, a big country, um, a big land mass, but a quite a small population. And it's very easy for Australians to stay in our scattered cities and not come together. Um, and what I've been really happy about is not just that AI Med has come, but we've been able over the last 18 months to put this national alliance together. So I've now got about 90 organisations, over 200 people. And when we started, I didn't know any of them <laughs> were there. So just by going around state to state, city to city and talking, I found outstanding doctors and computer scientists who are all desperate to join up with us. Uh, and I think when you build that critical mass, then great things will happen. I see the same issue with another Commonwealth country, Canada. I had the privilege of being there last week. And the same issue, um, very, very good talent in different cities, but not very well connected. And as a whole, I think there's tremendous potential and from really nice people that are very humble about their accomplishments and they have actually have done quite a bit. Mm. What are your thoughts on the Australian's clinician understanding of the impact that AI has on various clinical settings? You know, we've got a very informed uh, medical profession. They do read. Um, over the last 12 months, I have given dozens of talks, literally by invitation to a lot of the major clinical colleges, not just the radiologists, the GPs, the physicians, um, so, so I think there's a big appetite and an interest. Uh, I think Australians are naturally sceptical, but I think that's also healthy because they're going to ask the tough questions. Um, but Australia's got a reputation of be as being an early adopter of technology that works. So uh, I think this is, this is the right community to, to do the adoption. I still think the most important element is um, the human champions mm. behind all of this, and particularly clinicians that I've met a few here that have dual training and education. I think their credibility goes, is going to go a long ways in terms of adoption of AI here in Australia. Yep. So you co-founded the Centre for Health Informatics in 2000. Mm -hmm. What are some of the main focus areas in the next few years? Great. So, so this is a group of, of scientists. Some of them are doctors. Some of them are computer scientists, data people. Uh, we have human computer interaction folks. And so our interests are really about trying to solve the hard problems that still uh, are blocking adoption of, of AI and decision support. So we have a big interest, for example, in making sure the technology is safe. How do you know the AI is safe? Um, we want to get AI into the hands of consumers. What does it look like to build the tools they need? We're very interested in something that's called patient work. We talk about doctor's work. What's the job of being a patient? Um, we have a big interest also in, um, I guess people focus a lot on data. Uh, and how you could use AI for data. But we think, look, there's a lot of medical knowledge out there in the journals. How can you use AI to go and read the literature and summarize what's already known and digest it and say, look, for this patient, the literature says dot, dot, dot. Um, so there's a process we call systematic review, which is where humans do that. So we're trying to build computer systematic reviewers that will summarize the evidence just for you. Um, another reason I think this is really important to explore math and data science is that, as you know and heard from me yesterday, trying to grow this group of clinicians with a current um, data science education and background. I think it's going to be really key to push the agenda in medicine forward. Right now, I, I travel all over the world. I meet, uh, I've met a few clinicians here with a data science background. Um, there are just not many of us, probably less than 200. So I'm hoping that in three, five, 10 years, will have a few thousand, and I think that cohort will be very instrumental in pushing the AI agenda forward. So your vision is to grow from a couple of hundred to a few thousand data scientists. What is the support mechanism that's needed? It's basically 
um, have leadership appreciate the value of this kind of an education. And I had the privilege of speaking in front of almost 200 medical school deans in North America, and I clearly get the impression that they are ready to adopt AI in the medical education. They simply, as even hospitals will attest to, just don't know how to go about doing this. And I think, um, so th I think we've overcome the hardest, the biggest obstacle, which is acceptance. And now that they've accepted that as a true paradigm shift in medical education that needs to happen, I think now we just have to execute an action plan. And it will probably start off with a few schools in terms of having a few courses. And then I'm hoping eventually all schools will be mandating uh, a course in not just deep learning, but also all aspects of artificial intelligence that will be very relevant to their practice in the future. So we're not preparing the 2019 medical students well for the next decade of medical practice, and we really need to change that. Now, and I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that this, like the medical curriculum, for example, is already full. So often people will say, well, I'd love to teach data, I'd love to teach AI, but you know, do I stop teaching my students about how the shoulders put together? Mm -hmm. So we've got to get past that argument to make them realize that this is foundational uh, for future practice. Um, but I think the Krebs cycle needs to go. <laughs> As a molecular biologist, I'm saying that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, it's also to let the, the folks know in, in the computer science world, in the data science world, that healthcare is a great place to come and work uh, and, and that we need them. I say, um, I'm stealing the words from our leader, um, make medicine great again. <laughs> AI is at a crossroads in how quickly it will be used across healthcare. The current direction in which it will be adopted is dependent on the data sets that capture the varying cases of clinical care. The clinician's role still requires the use of AI to give faster and deeper analysis. Yet the interpretation and use of AI in decision support, until data sets are comprehensive, will rely on human knowledge and experience. The hopes of AI playing an ever-increasing role in healthcare is shared by clinicians attending AI Med. It's not without challenges, and Australian Health Journal will report on progress made by game-changing leaders, technology and clinical care. My name is Anne Dow. Thank you for watching.